um, by having um, better uh, nutrient um, potential there. So one of the main nutrients, as I mentioned before, that um, mycorrhizal fungi really improve the uptake of is phosphate. One of the worst things for phosphate, uh, for mycorrhizal levels in the pasture is high available phosphate. If you put on a lot of very available phosphate, it's one of the main things that you can do that will actually reduce the amount of mycorrhizal fungi that are there. So indirectly bad for earthworms, indirectly um, bad for the efficiency of um, plant uptake, um, not just of that uh, of phosphate, the efficiency of phosphate, but also the uptake of other nutrients that the plant's able to um, access better with good mycorrhizal levels, and uh, reducing the potential for uptake of um, water in hard times as well. So yeah, another example of the way in which all those organisms, and especially the mycorrhizal fungi and the um, earthworms, interact together. We've got um, uh, here the species of earthworms that I was looking at um, before. It seems in this paddock uh, almost all Aperectodia colliginosa. It's another young. season. Um, bigger ones have probably gone down uh, deeper for um, uh, surviving. What would um, Joe Bloggs call them? All right. Well, Aperectodia colliginosa has got a more convenient name, grey fieldworm. worm. <coughs> yeah. It's hardly as interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Easy to remember. Um, the grey fieldworm worm is the single most important agricultural species um, for New Zealand. Um, there's uh, quite a few, in fact hundreds of native species of um, earthworm in New Zealand, but they're not nearly as efficient at um, improving nutrient cycling or improving soil structure um, within there. So perhaps the most famous would be the milkworms amongst the native species um, that can get very big indeed and um, quite uh, large in circumference as well, but they're just very sluggish and don't have much effect on uh, nutrient cycling or soil structure. The grey fieldworm, on the other hand, is a very efficient burrower. Um, it's fast, active, um, helping turn over those nutrients very efficiently and improving um, soil structure um, better than um, pretty much any of the other um, introduced earthworm species that are around. But some of the other introduced earthworm species are also important. Um, starting from the top, there'd be uh, the dungworms, um, Lumbricus rubellus, um, that are able to um, uh, help with nutrient turnover just at the soil surface. So partly helping breaking down uh, thatch um, and improving soil structure in that regard. Um, the less thatch you have at the soil surface, the better penetration of water there's going to be, um, the better uh, root growth there's going to be, and better nutrient uptake from that point of view as well. So a lot of indirect benefits from having those surface dwelling um, dung worms. Um, as well as the uh, Aperectodia colliginosa, as you get uh, an area coming out of quite unimproved um, pasture at first, you often see some uh, grey worms um, or blue grey worms with a yellow pigmentation on them, so a yellow dot um, down near the base and a yellow collar around um, near the front. And that's Octolasian cyanium, which uh, doesn't really have a common name, but sometimes called um, uh, blue grey worm, um, not to be confused with the grey field worm. Um, it's also good as a burrower, but not as good as the Aperitodia colliginosa. So, as you continue with your liming program, um, with not putting on um, uh, excess levels of um, highly available nutrients um, that are coming through, um, like high phosphate levels. Um, as you continue along that biological program, you'll start to see uh, a shift in species towards the um, grey field worm coming in there, as it's uh, the most efficient species that come in, and the other worms don't seem to um, compete so well with them. But you'll still retain some level of dung worms on the top, and if you're lucky, have some big deep burrowing worms as well. Not so common in the South Island as in the North Island, but it's just a matter of time. They'll, they'll get here eventually. There are 
um, the startings of Lumbricus terrestris, um, one of the big worms. You see, well, probably most New Zealanders see them um, squashed on a pavement after a rain. Um, uh, it's, take, it's taken a long time for them to get to Canterbury. They finally got here, um, but they're slow to spread around. And they're not shrimp. Sorry? But they're shrimp. No, <laughs> no, no. Or they, they do swim when there's a rainfall around, and then when they get landed on a pavement, they, yeah, dry. Um, they um, uh, live down deep in the soil, so they're very good for uh, deep soil structure, and they also uh, come up to the surface and pull down leaves, so they're helping with that nutrient cycling of uh, leaf litter. So um, even more important in an orchard type situation, but they can still bring benefits to pasture. But we're content in um, most New Zealand pastures, if you can stimulate those levels of grey field worm there, those are the single most important earthworms for really showing that a soil's ticking over nicely <coughs> and for um, helping with that nutrient cycling and soil structure. Probably reached the uh, time limit. Yeah, uh, we're on 20, uh, that's about right, yeah. yeah. Um, but if there's yeah, any questions, fire away since we're, it's the last group. Tom, there's uh, just one question that I'm always coming up against with farmers talking about uh, organic nitrogen versus nitrogen. And I think going back to what we were talking about before with the clovers and the relationship between the bacteria and the fungi and how that the clovers are feeding carbohydrates to them, are they producing um, organic nitrogen? Right, right. The, the clovers, of course, are, 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 can be very efficient at, um, at producing um, organic nitrogen. So they're biologically fixing that nitrogen from the soil atmosphere that's in there. And the air around us is 78% nitrogen. There's certainly no nitrogen shortage in the world. But um, it's only going to be useful and also only going to be a problem when it's in a more available form. Now the beauty of um, biologically um, produced nitrogen is that it's produced um, pretty much exactly where you want it in the first place. So you want it getting into the plant, you don't want it leaching out um, of the soil. So if you're producing it within the root system of the very plants that you're trying to feed it with, um, then that's, that's an advantage to start off with. You're also going to be producing it at a rate that's sustainable biologically um, so that as the clover gets um, eaten or leaks out a bit of that nitrogen into the soil um, and as it gets eaten and the nitrogen comes out in the dung and the urine um, then you're going to have um, some more sustainable levels of nitrogen coming out to feed um, the whole of the pasture system along with that. There may be in, in many cases still a role for some supplemental nitrogen going on there but as, as we all know it's the um, small amounts of nitrogen at um, regular times that are much more efficient than putting on a lot of nitrogen or putting on your nitrogen all at once. Um, and um, so yeah as far as um, biological efficiency goes, if you've got um, good efficient nutrient cycling going on it will also reduce um, not just um, the other elements but also nitrogen, uh, the requirement for the amount of nitrogen that's needed to be fed and that makes sense rather than um, proteins sitting around uh, for a longer time, months or years longer than they really need to in that um, dung or thatch, if it's getting cycled through efficiently then um, the plants are going to have access to that nitrogen within the protein a whole lot faster. Thank you. When you talk about small amounts of nitrogen regularly, there's large amounts. Would you to quantify small amounts? Yep. Uh, yeah, quantifying small amounts of um, nitrogen. And in terms of kgs of nitrogen going on per hectare, um, to my mind, it's, it's, it's generally no more than 20 kgs of nitrogen going on. At a particular time. Um, in many cases, you're going to be able to have a nice, efficient system um, that um, doesn't require even, um, even that amount going on um, at once. And as far as number of times within the season, again, it depends on just the overall um, nutrient budget there. <coughs> Perhaps it's five times um, uh, just under 20 kg of uh, nitrogen going on at once. Yeah, is, is going to help a, a pasture system tick along nicely. There's a lot of biological feedbacks that you get, negative ones, from putting on too much nitrogen as well. As you increase the nitrogen input, you're going to um, generally 
um, start to outcompete the um, uh, clover that's in there because clover's competitive advantage within a pasture that's not overly fed with nitrogen is that it can produce its own nitrogen. And you want some good clover levels in that pasture, both for the efficiency of biological nitrogen production, but also because clover's a great thing to, um, to eat as well. It's got good meta meta uh, metabi Metabolizer bio. They're there. I can do it over now. And also generally higher um, mineral levels than um, many of the grasses um, that are otherwise in the pasture system as well. Um, well is, it, is it sustainable to have small, what you talking about, three applications of 20 units a year? Is that sustainable without having a negative effect on the earth? So, what you've been talking about now, soil. Um, yeah, I think, I think obviously it's cut every day, it's different. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think that um, three applications of um, 20 kgs of nitrogen per hectare um, can still work in nicely with, yeah. the, with the biological yeah. negative effects. Um, yes. Negative effects.